Hello, and welcome to our presentation entitled Staying Close But Keeping Distant, Providing Access to Social Opportunities in Times of Distance Learning. We wanted to walk you through some thoughts that we had about maintaining social learning experiences despite being in the distance learning platform. Um, we have some background information for you, some research and some case studies to share as well. So your presenters today are a team of educators um, from California State University Northridge, uh, from the WISH Charter Schools and Chime Institute, the charter school. And we will each introduce ourselves as we present. So I am Adi Buczynski. I am a special education teacher and special education teacher on special assignment at Chime Charter School. Um, which is a fully inclusive school in Southern California. As I mentioned today, our agenda is to describe some of the social needs in distance learning, evaluate some criteria for creating these meaningful spaces to have social interactions on the Zoom pl platform, and to review several case studies that the educators here have used to successfully address students' social needs in this platform. Hi everybody, my name is Amy Hanready and I'm a professor of special education at Cal State Northridge. So I just wanted to start us off by looking at kind of an overview of uh, what do we know about the need for addressing uh, social skills and social interactions, uh, both in person and, uh, and through distance learning. So if we look at the research, um, we know that in general, a school is an important place for students to get their social needs met. Um, positive relationships in school are really critical overall for a positive learning environment. We know that social skills and social relationships are closely tied to academic growth and also reduce the risk of depression, loneliness, and anxiety. Um, positive social skills predict later employment and engagement in the community and just general uh, positive adjustment throughout childhood and adolescence. So when it comes to students with disabilities in particular, now uh, this is the chart on the left is taken from a national transition study that is a, a national study that uses a representative sample of, uh, I believe, teenagers, middle school and high school students with disabilities and asked parents about the interactions that their children with disabilities had with children without disabilities. And you can see that by looking at the chart, there's some troubling trends. So just among students with autism, for example, 44% of families said that their child had, who was an adolescent had never had visits with friends. 84% uh, said they had rarely or never received telephone calls from friends. And 51%, just over half, said they had not been invited to other youth's social activity, activities during the most recent year. Uh, and there are similar trends across uh, many of the disability categories listed there. So if that is true during uh, typical in-person learning, we can only imagine the ways in which this might be amplified uh, during distance learning. So that chart on the top right uh, is looking at the idea of our, our circles of relationships. And for students with disabilities, many of the individuals who are in their circles are either close family members or people who are paid to be there. That's a very different circle than uh, students without disabilities who often have um, lots of individuals throughout the many different circles and very few people who are paid to spend time with them. Again, during distance learning, we see uh, everybody's circles are, uh, are becoming a little bit more sparse, but in particular, students with disabilities, again, are, are really constrained to interactions primarily with their families and sometimes uh, even during um, distance learning with people who are paid to spend time with them. Uh, so Eric Carter is 
a professor of special education at Vanderbilt University. And um, what he has done is, is a, he has a large body of research that focuses on social relationships for students with disabilities. And, um, and he has found that really without intentional efforts and facilitation, that students with, with disabilities are not spending much time with students without disabilities. And so we really need to spend intentional time on promoting those relationships. So, and I just wanted to emphasize some of the additional barriers that uh, students are experiencing now during this time of distance learning. So that top quote is uh, actually a study that it was long before uh, coronavirus and uh, distance learning, but was focused on college students in, in fully online programs. Um, but you can see long before we had uh, the vast majority of school-age students going to school at home, you can see that even college students experienced feelings of isolation, lack of self-direction and management, and decreases in motivation levels. So uh, we can guess that for younger students and students with disabilities who have uh, less ability to regulate and self-manage that these things will only be amplified. Um, without the social opportunities that school brings, because students with disabilities have less of those individuals in their, cir in their circles, they are at increased risk of isolation. Um, many of the opportunities for interaction that school does provide relies on uh, the ability to access both synchronous and asynchronous online platforms, and yet accessibility of those platforms without careful consideration adds an additional barrier uh, related to disability. And then uh, if we consider a comparison of students without disabilities, uh, many of the non-school types of interactions that those students might be engaging in now, like social media, texting, FaceTime, or even kind of social distance hangouts, uh, kids who are, you know, skateboarding with masks or going for bike rides, um, students with disabilities are less likely to be engaging in, in those activities overall, again, without some facilitation or support from somebody else. So given these barriers and concerns, uh, let's move towards kind of what do we do about it? Where can we start? Uh, so I wanted to start out by going back to Eric Carter. There he is. <laughs> and, um, and he makes some really concrete suggestions for uh, things that we can do to support relationships among kids with and without disabilities. Uh, so we really need to be thinking about what do these kids have in common and how can we build on those shared interests and motivations? Because many of our students might have difficulty with uh, communication access and support. We need to be really strategically considering those uh, within any of our facilitated interactions. In our class, online classes, we need to be considering the roles that students play and how to make sure that they have a, a, a valued way to engage and participate. He found that proximity to peers is one of those key indicators for social interaction. So when kids are not near each other, they're unlikely to interact with one another. Well, there are some additional barriers <laughs> related to proximity right now when they're not in the same physical space, but I think that you'll see in our examples some ways that we're working on creating more of that shared time together. Um, part of that is also within shared activities, uh, engaging in common tasks at the same time, um, helping peers to know how to engage and participate, uh, providing just the right amount of support. So there's that facilitation and careful knowledge of, uh, or strategic uh, knowledge of what students can do by themselves and what they need a little bit of help with and where we can fade back. And, um, and then just considering that ongoing process of uh, reflection and refinement and, and learning from our, our problem solving. So even though uh, these strategies were developed without uh, prior to distance learning. We really feel like all of these can be applied 
um, to the uh, strategies that we've been working on developing as we move through this process. So some things you'll want to consider as you're planning social interaction opportunities for students in your programs. Um, you'll want to consider who are the students and what are their goals that we're trying to target at this time, which staff are available to run the activity, um, and also which staff would be appealing members uh, for the students to engage with if there's a paraprofessional who is particularly well loved by the student community, they might be a really great staff member to include in that group. What are the structures? So you're going to want to work within the master calendar and grade level schedules might be a nice opportunity to put it in at lunchtime or at recess time if that's built into a master schedule so that it flows with the school day what materials are needed to be prepared or acquired to run a meaningful program. Um, are there things that we would want the students to have at home for a craft activity or something like that? Motivation, we wanna pitch this in a way that the activity sounds really appealing to the target students and also keeping in mind the inclusive mindset, the preferred peers that we're going to want to invite. Um, we wanna make sure that kids want to be there um, and it feels fun and engaging for them. And then what monitoring systems do we have in place to make sure that the student is making progress in their targeted areas of social growth and also that the program itself is providing an effective level of support and intervention to students. Hi, my name is Justine Vivar. I'm with Chime Charter School, part of the Chime Institute, and I am the speech language pathology assistant and assistive technology specialist. Um, a few ways that we've addressed working on social skills in this distance learning environment is we addressed it in small group sessions with preferred peers, uh, grade level or fun activities, and pushing into existing classrooms such as class reinforcements. Um, Part of this is like you kind of want it to be as natural as possible, similar to what we have in Zoom. And I think one of the important aspects of it is kind of having that structured and unstructured time. Um, that's why we, one of the reasons why we liked pushing in as a reinforcement, because it kind of provides that nutrition, lunch, recess type environment where it's unstructured and kids get a chance to kind of exist without academic structures in Zoom, which isn't all that common right now. Um, in a lot of these sessions, we plan collaboratively and in areas where the OT will address fine motor, um, speech can address pragmatics or language, and if we're sneaky, we can also throw in some speech sounds. Um, counseling can lead a mindfulness activity, and the PT can do a stretching activity. Um, this kind of looks, we don't always explicitly state, besides our introductions, that this is the occupational therapy portion, this is the physical therapy portion. We kind of weave it into the activity where OT will say, like, if we choose the um, a stress ball activity, the OT will say, okay, let's hold the stress ball, let's move it across the room, and then it's a fine motor activity without explicitly stating it. Um, speech and language will help set up the activity and set up expectations so it looks a lot like setting up like netiquette or zoom expectations but it's really expl explicit social skills teaching so we'll say stuff like we need to be respectful of other friends remember we can wait our turn if somebody says something and we like it when they're finished say when they're finished saying it we can compliment back wow that's cool i like it too um counseling will can open the activities up with a breathing exercise before we get started let's take a deep breath or sometimes they did it in breaks in between where, wow, that was a lot of work. Let's take a breath and lead a mindfulness in activity in between. And PT has ended it before as like a cool down um, where they've done kind of yoga or stretches to kind of calm their body down before moving on for the rest of the day. So the collaborative plan is kind of weaved throughout and I think the beauty in it is kids don't always realize they're working on all these goals. And even though we might only have three targeted students in the group and a few or a bunch that aren't, like when it's in the grade level, um, we used to do third grade dance parties where we would do similar activities. And besides our target students, those, these are just activities that are beneficial for the grade as a whole.
And that's kind of something you get to enjoy in Zoom that you might not always get to do when you are in person. Um, some successful activities that we've done. Um, we'll do animated shorts. Um, and we've seen a lot of success with the ones that don't have talking because it kind of gives kids a chance to come up with their own responses. And then a lot of the kids will have different interpretations of what's going on. So it's nice um, to kind of have something to build on versus things that are explicit with talking. Um, another way that we kind of wove PT and OT is we would do a freeze dance. So we would play a song and then freeze it at random moments. And it gives kids a chance to kind of like laugh at each other. And sometimes we'll collaborate with the OT and PT and make sure um, they're standing on one foot when we freeze the song. Um, crafting activities, again, it's a mixed one um, with speech and language and OT and all of us, but it's really kind of like you can work on sequencing, you can work on fine motor, you can work on descriptive language. Simon Says is a fun one to do with a lot of kids with different needs. Um, Simon Says is a fun one to work on with kids that use augmentative and alternative communication because it's kind of as simple as going to the actions page and then they get to hit any word and then all the kids or all the adults on the screen have to do it too. So it's, um, it's kind of a fun way to bring AAC to the forefront and kind of do it in an airless activity. Uh, scavenger hunts are another really good one. Um, I've found a lot of success with scavenger hunts and similar activities that have a mix of, I have to look on the screen, I have to get away, I have to look at the screen, I have to get away. Um, it kind of helps with the tension and it's again something that they might not have when they're in the classroom where it's all the stuff in the classroom and this is a thing where kids can kind of introduce a little more of themselves to the screen with the stuff that they have around their home. Some keys to success that we've seen in the variety of activities we've had. We've had a lot of chance to experiment with these uh, distance learning social skills. Um, some of the keys to success, like I mentioned, was offer students something fun they may not have access to in school. So that's themes. When we used to do dance parties, we would do, we had a bring your own pet or like bring your animal, like an animal themed. So some kids brought stuffed animals, some kids brought their dogs. Um, and that's not something you will, you know, you can't usually bring your dog to a classroom. So that's just another fun thing where kids can kind of talk to each other. Um, costumes. So the adults, I feel like the adults had just as much fun with this, a lot of us, but it's a chance to show up to the party in a costume in a onesie. And it's that visual interest. It's offering them something they don't have. Um, and the grade level dance parties, again, are something you can offer in Zoom that might, that is harder to arrange or you might not be able to arrange when you are in person. The mix of structured and unstructured activities offers um, structure and then gives kids the unstructured, again, similar to what's like a recess or lunch offering where kids aren't, you know, they're kind of free to be kids and interact with each other without always having the adult lead it. Um, if you're working with a targeted student, similar to when we were working on um, reinforcements, so we would do hidden social skills and reinforcements groups, um, I would cater that to their motivation. So for some students, it was a dance party. For some students, it was a movie party. For some students, it was a fashion party. Um, and that kind of helps the student be motivated and want to show up because they had control over it. Um, another success is to prepare parents or whatever adults are helping at the time um, with questions or prompts or tips to bring. Um, and so their child can participate when it's their turn. So we used this a lot when it was a grade level activity where we would email the parent and say, we're going to throw this third grade level dance party. And at random points, we're going to call on random students. Um, we'll call on your child for this is our question. So it gives them the chance to help them prepare it ahead of time. Or we did it very similar with the scavenger hunt where they're like, can you help them pick an item that they have a lot to say? Or maybe the opposite. Can you pick an item where we can elicit a lot of language from it? So adults were a very big, important part. And we received a lot of positive feedback, um, having them prepared ahead of time. 
Um, another thing that helped a lot was sending a little invitation that we posted in Google Classroom or Parent Square, whatever medium you used. And this kind of gave parents um, an expectation and it, it gave kids something to be excited about. And it, for us, it gives us a chance to list things like the expectations, uh, the Zoom link, um, some extra information to kind of get it all out there so you're not answering questions you know, along the way. Um, one of, and lastly, one of the really important ones is that the adults should participate too, or to, you know, to the greatest ability they can. And I feel like that also ties into something you might not always have access to at school where your teachers can dress up and dance with you and bring their dog. Um, and it's just really great for rapport building and social skills. So hi everyone, my name is Sarah Brady. I am a sixth grade education specialist at WISH Community Charter School, which is a fully inclusive charter school located in Westchester. And I will be jumping us right into our talk about case studies. So as outlined in this program and looking at Eric Carter's suggestions for supporting um, our students with relationships during distance learning, the needs are definitely there. The benefits are also, you know, they're, they come with, with supporting them in these areas. And we're gonna take a look a little more deeply into how we've actually made this work during distance learning when the schedules are so different and uh, peer connection can be challenging. So I created a lunch club for my focus student. He has uh, significant support needs and complex communication needs. and he really thrives on peer interaction. And when thinking about how to support him um, in collaboration with his mom, we really knew that getting him in a group with his peers some way was gonna be really the key to unlocking his engagement and uh, his access to his peers. So we came up with this lunch club idea. And I've outlined the steps. There's also a really helpful video that we'll look at after this that was shared on Tash's webinar uh, that goes into the whole process of how I set this up and what it looked like. So step one is selecting peers based on this focus student's preference and, and the opportunity for the focus student to connect with those peers naturally throughout the day. So which are the peers he really gravitates towards and who does he get to see you know, the most throughout his day where he has repeated um, opportunities to connect. And it's also really important to make sure that those peers are interested and want to participate in the lunch club. So nothing should be forced. It should be an open conversation. Hey, do you want to join this club? Um, just throwing it out there uh, and, and have their buy-in. Um, that's absolutely essential when, when setting this up. Step two is really setting a set, excuse me, set a designated day or time for the lunch club per week, especially when you're working with little ones. They need a set day and time that they can remember um, and that they know on Tuesdays, I have lunch club with Miss Brady at 1.30. Um, so that was really helpful for them. Step three is if the focus student uses an AAC device to download that software program, if you can, on your personal iPad to model and facilitate communication during the lunch club. So my focus student uses Pod. I was able to download the same exact uh, Pod system and the settings that he uses on my personal iPad, and I use that to facilitate language and communication. If you are not able to do that, there are ways to do kind of a low tech print. You could just print pages of the symbols and use that to model if you're not able to download the whole software system onto your iPad. So it is possible and definitely really helpful when thinking about promoting overall engagement for all of the peers. Step four, um, preparing some natural conversation starters to use. So what did you do over the weekend? Wow, English class was really hard, that last assignment. What, what did you guys think? Um, and use them if the, the conversation needs some facilitation or help getting started. So it kind of circles back to the suggestions from Eric Carter about just enough support. So again, with social opportunities, it's really important to not 
over lead, over facilitate. I had those kind of in the back of my mind. And if I noticed there was a lull, I may pull one out to kind of get the conversation going again. Um, but I definitely wanted to have the kids take the lead and have it be school appropriate or, or uh, outside activity appropriate if they were talking about TikTok, um, but not making it adult centered. And step five is make sure that everyone has an opportunity to be heard, including the focus student. So a lot of times they'd be like, oh wait, I think I heard so-and-so. Can you go again? Everyone let's listen. And the student would chime in using his iPad and we could all hear and comment, um, but regularly circling around and saying, oh, do you have anything you wanna add? Is there anything you think about this? Um, and step six is repeat. And it was a great, great opportunity for both the focus student and his peers to connect, um, especially during distance learning when it's one big screen and all the peers and there's not that central small group focus where you really get to connect on a deeper level. So we're gonna go to the next slide, which will share um, a succinct video on kind of how this looked. Again, it was shared on the TASH webinar. So if you're able to definitely go check that webinar out and let's take a look at what it looks like. Hi, my name is Sarah Brady. I am a sixth grade special education teacher at Wish Charter, which is a fully inclusive charter school located in Westchester. And I created this lunch group for my student, Finn, through collaboration with his mom. We really wanted to come up with ways that he could meaningfully connect with his peers. Uh, virtual learning was great. He loved seeing their faces, but it didn't allow for as much back and forth exchange, especially when formal instructions started. So I came up with the idea of having a Zoom lunch call twice a week. These specific students were in Finn's advisory class, which is essentially homeroom, and I would see them every morning interact with him. So I brought it up to them. I said, hey, are you interested in this? And they were like, oh my God, yes. And then they invited another friend to join. So strategies that I've used during this lunch call, I do a lot of modeling. I downloaded Finn's pod system, the exact system that he uses on his uh, personal device onto my personal iPad. And so when he, uh, I'm communicating and when he's communicating or his peers, I'm modeling that language for him. His mom, uh, she's amazing in regards to AAC. Uh, and she kind of taught me, oh, you know, to tell him what page you're going into, you know, even if he's not yet accessing that vocabulary, you're kind of helping him to understand where you got to those those different words. And I also uh, want to pause and make sure everyone's hearing Finn when he does participate and communicate, and also to regularly say, hey, is there anything, Finn, you wanna add? Uh, we're working on him making um, comments uh, and you know asking questions and just uh, increasing his consistent communication with his device, his talker. And it feels very natural. Um, usually I start with, how's everyone feeling? Just a social emotional check-in, especially given the circumstances of virtual learning. And then I kind of just let it go where, I, I let it go, the conversation go where it's gonna go naturally. All right, you guys know what I'm gonna ask. Let me go into questions. How is people everyone how is everyone let's go around i want to hear uh misha i see you first on my screen how are you feeling girl let's hear i'm feeling really really happy and excited that it's friday and and it got excited mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i forgot it is friday finn misha said she feels happy and happy excited Shaking the hands. Same. Finn's ready to share. Oh, Finn, tell us. Say it again. Friendly. You're feeling friendly. I wonder, Finn, if you feel friendly because you're in your group chat with your all your friends. Angie, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling good, I guess. Like, 
that's listen good is good good, good, yeah. is good. good. so opinion you're feeling good good awesome if he doesn't say anything and you know I hear something I'm like oh wait it sounds like Finn was saying something Finn can you say it again I, I see Finn typing banana Finn say it again Sing bagel bagel yum I love bagel. I love bagel. Bagel. bagels are the best so if there's a uh, pause or lull in the conversation, I may guide it like, hey, what are we doing this weekend? So it's, we have sleep, sleep, movie, concert, sleep, movie, and concert. Did I miss anything? Finn, do you, what are you going to do this weekend? Or did you have something to add? Work out, work out. That's an interesting idea, Finn. What did he say? Say it again. Say it again. Oh, is it gone? Um, the Polar Carol. He said the Polar Express and then Carol. I think Polar he's Express. Head to Christmas. Oh, ben, are you in a Christmas movie mood? Because let me tell you, you can totally watch Christmas movies. In National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. But it's been such an amazing and honestly easy way to give him that access to his peers. And it's been so meaningful for them. Another case study we're going to look at is one that I did with one of my target students. Um, she is a third grade student with high level of support need and complex communication systems um, and working, completing her work and assigned activities throughout the school day was a real challenge. And at the beginning of distance learning, we struggled with motivation. Um, so we put into place a system where every assignment that she completed or every math problem that she did earned her minutes uh, towards a party on Fridays. And the party on Fridays, she was able to invite peers that were motivating to her and we created a new theme for each party. Um, so we did, one party we did was a jazzercise party um, where everyone came in costume and our physical therapist led this activity and did some fun jazzercise moves that were specifically related to physical therapy goals in the student's IEP. We did a fashion design party, which our occupational therapist led. Um, the students all were given a template of a t-shirt or a dress and then we did a salt painting activity. So we just sent an email home to families a couple days in advance saying this, this student invited your child to the party. Here's the Zoom link. Feel free to print out the templates if you want. If you want to do this cool salt painting, just bring some salt and water and paint um, and we'll give you the directions at the party. We also had a lot of dance parties. We heard a lot of Taylor Swift on our Friday celebrations. Um, and this was really motivating for the student because the parties were highly enjoyable for students in her age range. And she was able to use her communication device to make selections about which students would be involved in the party. So there was self-determination involved. There was use of the AAC device involved in planning the party. Um, and that was really motivating. And it also got her to do all her assignments that the teachers were assigning. Um, the people involved were the special education teacher, myself. I, I managed the earned minutes. I kept a running tally all week long and kept her updated on how long her party was going to be. I contacted the students, families, provided the Zoom link, let them know what materials were going to be required to participate what special costumes the students should wear if it was appropriate. The speech language pathology team collaborated um, on the social communication piece on the student using her AAC device. And we built into each party some downtime to just chat, both at the beginning as kids were getting on, just, hey, what have you done this week? What's been going on? Um, and then also towards the end of the party where they could chat about how the party went and re look at each other's dresses that they had designed or talk about the cool dance moves that they had seen. 
And then, as I mentioned, our PT and OT designed the motor-based components of the activities and co-hosted the parties. And much how Justine described earlier, we, we made it very seamless. We never said, and now our physical therapist will lead some stretching activities that are related to your friend's IEP goal. Uh, we just said, oh, cool, Ms. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so is going to lead us in some really cool dance moves. Everybody, let's see. And um, we had opportunities for other kids to incorporate dance moves that they wanted to teach. And um, so it was a really seamless integration of both social skills and social opportunities, but also students' IEP goals across different areas. Another more mild case study that we did was a group of three target students who had general turn-taking social skills goal one had a sound goal for R, and I actually believe um, a few had language goals that I didn't mention in the slide. Um, but for our activity, we let them know ahead of time, um, we're gonna do this activity on this day. Can you guys pick some friends you want to join you? So they actually picked three to four friends. A few of them actually picked the same friend, so it was kind of a nice controlled group. Um, so it was our targeted students and some students that we knew would elicit language from them because they're preferred. Um, we did a mix of both. And if not, um, if their friend just happened to be a friend who just happens to be on the quiet side, we'll consult with the teacher. Is there somebody else they're close to um, that we can invite? That's maybe a little more on the chatty side. That's another strategy we've used. Um, with this particular group, we would show videos that happen to also be sound loaded um, for this one we did a video called Burns Out Online. And like I mentioned earlier, it's um, a wordless video um, where you're working primarily off of like facial expressions, ongoing things, what, what's happening in the video. Um, we emailed parents ahead of time. This is the type of video we're gonna be watching. This is what we're gonna do. Um, in conjunction to that, we also had students bring in items um, so for this one, we're like, bring in an item that starts with R, and some kids brought in something red or um, some sort of ball. And that, again, kind of gives you, like, the structured and the unstructured time, the time um, that they're sharing that's not academic. It's taking advantage of the distance learning situation where they're able to share things that they have in their home that they might not be able to share in the classroom. The adults also brought in their own items. and we modeled without demand. So for the rest of the students, it kind of just looks like us sharing, but it was our time to explicitly teach language expansion and turn taking. And because it was the, the R sound, um, that was something we provided to the whole group and not just our targeted student. Like we mentioned, it was, um, it's kind of a seamless process. We don't explicitly state anything. We just kind of weave it through the activity. Um, and I think the kids really enjoyed it that way. And again, it's whether it's the targeted students or the students joining, these are skills. This particular group was in second grade and just in general, most second graders can use help with their R's. <laughs> and most second graders, especially in this distance learning platform could use help with social skills. And it gave them something to look forward to every week. Um, towards the end, I've had, we had several students say like, what video are we gonna watch next week? Can we watch a video about dogs? And it kind of gives, kids agency over what's going to happen next and it helps build motivation and it also gave the adults <laughs> time to kind of collaborate and figure out activities that were more catered to their motivations. So the whole goal of this presentation was to really outline the clear needs that our learners have for social opportunities, especially during distance learning. Um, we really tried to use our time here to show you and give you examples of how we have facilitated this inclusion and these social opportunities for our students. And even though distance learning looks different and it is not the way we're used to running our classes and our school day, uh, creating those social opportunities, it is possible. And hopefully this has been a support to you all to get these type of activities started in your classroom. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Our emails are all listed here and we hope you enjoyed this presentation.